Hey guys, it's Chili here. Welcome back to Intermediate C++ Tutorial 15. Today, we're going to have a whirlwind tour of the concept of iterators and some of their practical manifestations. Anyways, we're going to focus on the most important and useful parts of iterators. So the first question you're going to have is, well, you know, why do I care about iterators? And one of the main reasons is because iterators are used for many of the functions of the containers. I've kind of tiptoed around this up until this point. But if you look at things like vector erase, which allows you to erase elements from a vector, you need to be able to use iterators in order to use this member function. This iterator shit it is going to unlock massive skill trees in your standard library skill progression. So now that hopefully I've got your attention, what the hell are iterators anyways? Well, they're basically pointers. They behave like pointers, they look like pointers, they often have a basic pointer at their heart under the hood. But they also have some smart machinery under the hood which can make them safer and sexier than normal pointers. Now the general flow is that containers, they poop out iterators and those iterators work on that container. So the vector container, it has member functions begin and end, and they poop out iterators to the beginning and the end of the vector container. One thing I want you to note right now about iterators, very important, is that the valid range for an iterator is typically going to be from the first element to one past the last element. So basically there is a non-existent imaginary element past the last element and that is considered to be the end of the container. You'll see how this works in a little bit. Alright, let's look at some code here. I've got a container, a vector, it's got eight elements. Uh, let's get an iterator to it. So first thing you're going to want to know is, well, what is the type of an iterator? And the type of an iterator depends on the container that it is going to be iterating over. So vector int has a different iterator than a vector of floats, which is different than the iterator for a std string. Now every container has a bunch of type defs inside of it that you can access and one of the type defs is the iterator type def. So this will tell you the type of the iterator for that container. So we can do std vector int and then scope re resolution iterator and that's the type of the iterator. And let's go i is equal to now the functions to get an iterator for the uh, for the container are going to be right here, iterators. So the basic ones are uh, begin and end. So let's look at them first. So we go v.begin and that returns an iterator to the beginning of the vector. It's going to point to the first element. Now if we want to output the value of that element, you might say, okay, I'll just go c out, I'll go i, that'll do it. But that's not going to do it because i is the iterator. We want the value that that iterator points to. So just like a pointer, you put a star in front of that, you dereference the iterator, you get the value, that'll print out the value. If I do that, I should get zero. And there you go, we got zero. Now just like a pointer, we can increment the iterator and that'll make it point to the next element in the container. Then if we dereference and output again, we are gonna get a one after the zero. Now these iterator type defs, they can get pretty long, they can stink up your code. There's a beautiful thing that came in with C++11, you already know it, it's auto. So if we auto this, it will detect the type of iterator as being output by begin, and it will make our code a hell of a lot less shittier. Auto with iterators is a motherfucking match made in heaven. All right, let's do a simple for loop with iterators. So we go for auto, i is going to be our looping iterator and i is going to equal v dot begin and we also want an iterator to the end that's the part that's the place where we're going to stop and that is going to be e is equal to v dot end so now we've got our beginning and our end and then we do while i is not equal to the end i well do plus plus i. With iterators, it is often better to put the to do the pre-increment than the post-increment. Doesn't matter much for ints, but for iterators, it actually does matter. The performance is sometimes better if you put the increment before rather than after. Then for every iteration, we're going to dereference our loop iterator. Output that. Let's output a space between all the elements, and there you go. You run it, and you should get what you expect. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now let's say we wanted to loop from the second element to the third from the last element. How would we do that? Well, like I said, iterators, they behave 
like pointers, so we can use pointer arithmetic to do that. So begin plus one will get us the second element, and n end minus two will get us the third from the last element, or that'll that'll iterate up to the third from the last element. And if we run this, now we only print out one, two, three, five. Well, apparently I fucking can't count, but you get the idea. You get the motherfucking idea. And pretty much all of your standard pointer operations can work. Uh, for example, let's, uh, instead of incrementing i, let's do i plus and equals two. So this will skip values, and we should now only see uh, even values being printed. Yeah, zero, two, four, six. Another example is you can subtract one iterator from another. So if I go v dot end minus v dot begin, what do you think this will output? Take a guess. It outputs 8, right? Which is the same as you would get if you were subtracting pointers. It's just the distance between the pointers. So subtracting two iterators returns an integral type, which is the distance between them. And the distance between beginning and end is just the size of the container. One more example, let's say I've got a class pube, it's got a public uh, member int x. I can create a vector of pubes, I can loop through them, and I want to print out my pubes. Now, it doesn't know how to insert a pube into the uh, out stream, the O stream, but what we can do is we can access the member, right? So we can output the member x by doing this, dot x, and that'll work. Or we can also use the shorthand that uh, pointers have, and we can do the arrow x, and that also works, and you run that, you get the expected output. So iterators are like pointers, but stronger. They can protect you from certain things. What happens if I try to dereference an iterator to an element that is past the last element in the container? Again, an exception. What happens if I try to uh, decrement an iterator outside of the accepted range? I get an exception. And these features can save you hours and hours of debugging time. And I hear you guys, you're saying, that's cool, but you're not doing anything here that I couldn't have done with motherfucking indices. Impress me, Chili. Well, let's take a look at some things that you can't do with indices. Let's say you got a uh, vector here, you got some elements, you want to erase one of the elements. Well, the erase member function here, it takes an iterator to the position that you want to erase. So all we got to do, let's say we want to erase element three, is we go uh, v dot erase, and we want to erase uh, v dot begin plus three. That's the third element in. And if we run this, element three has been erased from existence. You can also see here that erase has a version that takes two iterators, and this will allow us to remove elements in a range. And this is very important. Listen up. Now, when you give a range uh, for a container with iterators, generally what you have is the range of elements starts from the first iterator and is up to but not including the last iterator. This is very common. So first inclusive, last exclusive. So let's say we want to erase elements three, four, five. Well, we're going to start at begin plus three. We're going to end at begin plus six. And you might say, well, why six? Well, because the erase operation goes up to, but not including the end iterator here. So it's going to erase three, four, five, but not six. And you run that, you see you get the expected result. Now, remember I told you that iterators are more powerful than pointers because they can let you know when they've been invalidated. So imagine I've got an iterator pointing to this element uh, here. I guess this one right here, and then I erase these ones. What happens to this iterator? It's now pointing to something that got erased. Well, if we run this in debug, see we get an exception. Uh, this iterator was smart enough to know that uh, it was no longer, it was invalidated and it let us know that through an exception. Another situation where we'd get an invalidated iterator is if I tried to push something back into the container, you're gonna see that we get a problem here. And you might be wondering, why is this a problem? We're only adding an element uh, into the end of the container. It is not affecting this position here. But remember, when you add an element to a container, that container might have to reallocate and copy all its members. And if you reallocate and copy everything, uh, this iterator under the hood, it's just a simple pointer. And that pointer is not going to be pointing to the correct memory. It's going to be pointing to bad memory now. So different operations have different effects on the validity of iterators, and you can find that information 
on the uh, documentation for each operation here, it says invalidates iterators and references at or after the point of the erase. And push back here, if the new size is greater than the capacity, then all iterators and references are invalidated. So you can get information about w when your iterators are going to be invalidated by looking at the reference pages for the different operations. Now sometimes an iterator operation can give you some information to allow you to recover from an invalidation. So take a look at this loop here and you'll see we're looping over all the elements and we are going to erase when the element is a multiple of three. Uh, now obviously the first time we erase we are going to invalidate this iterator then when we try to increment it we are going to get an exception. So we see here that the erase operation returns an iterator and uh, that return value is the iterator following the last removed element. So if we've got an iterator i, we use it to erase. Um, that's going to erase this guy. And what the operation is going to do is it's going to invalidate this iterator. And then it is going to copy 4 over to here. It's going to copy 5. It's going to copy 6. It's going to copy 7. And this will be your new sequence. Uh, and it returns an iterator now to this 4, which was the element that followed the one that was being deleted. So now you're going to get this return value here and you can use this to continue your iteration over the container. So what we can do is we can, when we erase, we set i equal to the return value of erase and now i will no longer be an invalid uh, iterator. Now if we do this we need to make some adjustments to the loop. We are not going to increment here, instead we are going to do else plus plus i. And the reason why we do this, well I'll tell you what, I'll leave it as a puzzle for you, try to figure it out and the answer will be on the wiki page. But yeah, these container operations are super powerful. I mean, look at this one. I'm going to insert uh, into the vector v at position 3, and I'm going to insert a range from v2. So I'm going to insert these two values from v2 into this. I'm going to splice from one vector into another. This shit is very powerful, very convenient. Think about it. In a game, you're going to have a whole bunch of different vectors, collections, containers of all sorts of different things, enemies, characters, relationships, events, and the, the ability to manipulate them like this is obviously going to be really important. Another thing we can do is we can initialize a container with a range from another container using iterators. So this will initialize v2 using a subrange of v. v2 now stores values which are a subrange of v. Now, I hear you guys, and you're, you're saying, okay, so this stuff is important and it's useful, but why does the standard library do it this way? It seems so much of a pain in the ass. Why don't, for insert, why don't they just use indices instead of using iterators? And I'm going to show you that right now. So let's say we got a function print here, and it's going to print out all the elements of an int vector. And that works fine for a vector of ints. doesn't work for a vector of floats because types don't match here. So what can we do? Well, as you know from intermediate 14, you can template this function and now it'll work with vectors of ints or vectors of floats. Now let's say I want to use my printing out function to print out the contents of a string. Well, that's not going to work because we take a vector here, but what we could do is we could just template the entire container type here. And well, now vec isn't really a good name here. But if we template on the entire container, now we can use print to print out from string as well. Now we get a little bit of a bullshit in here. This should actually be size uh, t. Now let's use a different kind of container. So we're going to include forward list. And forward list is a container that works based on linked lists. So if we do, if we create now a std forward list of ints, we'll call it li, and we'll give it some values like this. And let's uh, try to call print on our list of integers. You'll see here that IntelliSense is not going to give us any grief. But if we try to build and run it, we're going to get errors. Size is not a member. And uh, binary this does not define this operator. Well, forward list being a linked list doesn't have an easy way of getting the size of the container. To get the size, you'd have to follow all the links and count all the elements. So there is no size element in here, and there is no random access operation. You can't index into it. So for a container like forward list, this kind of iteration isn't going to cut it. So what do we do? Well, instead of templating our function on container type, let's template it on iterator and let us accept two iterators instead of accepting a container. So we accept iterators to the beginning and the end of the range that we want to print. 
and then we loop through this using our for loop with iterators. And so now these ones now have to pass in iterators. And that's gonna look something like this. And if you run it, now you get no errors and everything prints out properly. And this here is the secret to the reason why the standard library uses iterators, because it allows you to create generic algorithms that can run on any kind of container, as long as it supports the iterator operations. And this is exactly how the algorithms library from the standard library works. And these, these algorithms, they can all run on all sorts of different kinds of containers. And this gives us a very elegant and powerful system to work with. One thing I want you to be aware of is that not all iterators are created equal. Obviously, the iterators for something like a vector, uh, they're more powerful than the iterators for something like a forward list. Because a forward list, you can only move by one element at a time. But for a vector, you've got random access. You can jump around any way you want. And the way the categories work, well, I'm going to put a link to this page on the wiki. but. Um, you've got random access iterators which can basically do everything and then you've got lower grades of uh, iterators bi-directional they can't jump around but they can move forward and backwards and you've got only forward iterators and then you've got only output or input iterators and if you look at the reference page for a container down in iterator you can see what kind of iterator it supports so forward list supports forward iterator vector supports random access iterator, etc. Another thing I want you guys to be aware of is the existence of const iterators. So look at this function here. It takes a const reference to a vector container. If I call vec.begin, uh, what kind of iterator do you think I'm going to get out? It's actually a const iterator. And the difference between a const iterator and a normal iterator is if you dereference a const iterator and you try to use it to modify an element, Compile is going to say, no, fuck your shit, you're not allowed to do that. So you can still get iterators from constant containers and use them in algorithms, but only for reading. You can't use them for writing, which makes sense because it's a constant container. You should not be able to write to any of the elements. And the way the standard library achieves this, it has uh, const overloads for begin and end. So you've got the normal one here that returns an iterator, and then you've got the const version here that returns a const iterator. And this one is the one that gets called if you call it on a const reference to the container. You can also call cbegin and cend, and that will force it to return a const iterator no matter what kind of reference you have to the container. So if you want to make sure you get a const iterator, you call cbegin, cend. Now, besides the begin and end functions, there's also functions to uh, get iterators that are reverse iterators. So that's R begin and R end. R begin will point to the last element. R end will give you a reverse iterator pointing one before the first element. And when you increment a reverse iterator, uh, what that does is that actually moves it to the left, it moves it down by one. So what we can do is we can use R begin and R end, pass in reverse iterators, and they will cause an algorithm to work in the reverse direction. So now we've re reversed pubes, we got CBUP. Again, not all containers support reverse iterators. Obviously, uh, forward list is not going to support reverse because it only moves forward. Now, besides begin and end, there is also a free function in the standard library, uh, std begin and there's also std end, and you can call that function on a container and it will get the beginning and end iterators. And that works the same, either is fine, but these functions have a special use. Let's say you have just a standard uh, C array. Now let's say you want to print this array out uh, using our function. Well, you can't do r dot begin because it doesn't have members, it's not a it's not a uh, object. But what you can do is you can do std begin and std end on an array and what it will do is it will get you an iterator. It actually just returns a pointer, um, int pointer. But an int pointer is basically an iterator, right? It walks and talks like an iterator, so therefore it's going to work in this template function. If we run it, yeah, we get 420. So this free function begin and free function end, they allow you to run algorithms, to run generic algorithms on C arrays. Very sexy. And just a little side note, this is actually how range-based for loops work. And that's why they can work with uh, standard C arrays and also containers. And those free functions are found in the iterator library. You can see them here if you want to look up the uh, documentation. 
There's some other iterator operations here, like advance will move an iterator by a distance, distance will calculate the distance between two iterators, and next and previous will increment, uh, will return an incremented or a decremented iterator. And you might say, well, these, I mean, we could do this stuff just with our standard uh, pointer arithmetic, right? And here's the thing, normally, yeah, we could use pointer arithmetic to advance an iterator, but for something like a forward list, it's not a random access iterator, you can't bump it up by three spots using pointer arithmetic. But you can use std advance to move it up by three. And the way it works is advance will detect what kind of iterator you have. If it's random access, it will just add three to the iterator. But if it's not random access, then it will increment the iterator three times. Now the iterator library here also has some iterator adapters which allow you to create some special purpose iterators to do some cool shit. So let me give you a scenario here. So let's say you've got an algorithm sum. It takes uh, iterators for two containers and iterator for an output container and it adds together the elements from the two input containers and stores in the output container. So it would look something like this in a diagram. So it's going to the two input iterators are going to be incremented and the elements added together and the result is assigned to the output iterator which is also being incremented as the operation proceeds. So you need two input iterators, you need an end iterator for one of these guys to tell you the range of the operation and you need an output iterator. So here I got the two inputs, they're vectors of int and float, the output is a list of float and I do this now. First of all, the compiler isn't going to like this uh, for one main reason, and that is these guys all have different types of iterator, but my template is only templated on a single iterator type. So it, it thinks that they should all be the same type, but actually they're all different iterator types. So what we need to do is we need to add more template parameters. So now the first input in the end is of type one, the second input is of type two, and the output is of type three, and everybody is happy. Except of course, if you run it, you get a big fat exception. The reason for that exception is because there is no place to store the result, right? This uh, container is empty. So when you try to assign to it, or when you try to increment the iterator, it's gonna give you a big fat exception. So what you could do is you could say, okay, well, I'm just gonna resize this container and it's gonna need eight because the operation is going over this range, which has eight elements. So it's gonna output eight results. And if you do that, it works fine, but we can do something a little sexier here. So in the iterator adapter section, there is a back insert iterator. And the back insert iterator will do it, instead of working like a normal iterator, iterating over the elements of a container, anytime you try to assign to the back insert iterator, it is going to put that at the end of the container. So it only puts things at the end of a container. It doesn't try to assign to existing elements. So that's the back insert iterator. There's a helper function called back inserter, which will create a back insert iterator if you give it a container. So what we can do is we can include iterator and down here, we don't need this anymore. And now let's create a back inserter. So we'll go std back inserter and we'll give it the container and it will create a back insert iterator from that container. And this will insert new elements into here. And if we run it, there you go, magic like this. You don't have to pre-size your container anymore. It'll just put the results in there. And this is ex especially powerful if you want to have a bunch of operations and accumulate the results in a single container, store them one after another, back inserter is your go-to. Let me just show off one more guy like this. So we have iterator adapters. We also have stream iterators and they're like adapters, only instead of um, working on containers, they allow you to have an iterator into a stream. So if we look at O stream iterator here, we can construct an iterator if we give it a reference to an output stream. So instead of putting the results of our sum into a container, let's put it directly to a stream. So we go std O stream iterator and we got to give it the type that it's going to format to. So float. It's going to output as floats and the stream is going to be std c out. And there you go. Now we don't need this anymore because we're just going to be outputting directly to the screen if we run it. There you go. If you want to add some delimiters between there, you can give it a c string here. So we're going to give it a comma and a space. Now it prints them out with comma and space delimiters. Pretty schmexy. 
Now let's take a look at the homework. We're going to be revisiting the linked list stack that we did in Intermediate 6. So I've added some extra code to main.cpp here. And uh, my challenge for you is to get this to work. You're not allowed to modify any of this code here. So you've got to modify the stack to get it to work with this code here. I'm running a uh, range-based 4 on the stack. So you have to find a way to make the stack compatible with range-based for loops. And I'm not going to tell you any more than that. I want you to do your own research and try to figure out how to solve this. This is like a little puzzle. This isn't your straightforward homework, connect the dots. This is a bit of a puzzle here. So modify stack, get it to work with this code. Then if you want an extra challenge, you can uncomment this uh, code here and try to get this to work as well. And then I'll about do it for this tutorial. Thanks for watching. Hope you liked the video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more C++.